Um, so my name is Stephanie Sinclair Kritz, and I am going to be talking about um, how we use QJS to identify zero dose children um, uh, in four countries. So I'll give you, uh, be giving a little bit of background um, along with uh, giving some methods. Ah, oh, there we go. How we use QJS and then answer any questions. So first off, um, my name is Stephanie, as I said, and I'm a data manager at Village Reach. And so we're a nonprofit organization that um, works in Sub-Saharan Africa and the United States. Um, so our mission is to transform healthcare to deliver uh, delivery to reach everyone. Our vision is to a world where each person has the healthcare they needed, needed to thrive. And so one of our 2030 goals is to reduce inequities to access um, quality primary health care among the most underreached communities. And as we look at our uh, the 2030 sustainability goals, we see that we're, we're falling short in many countries. And so right now, uh, health care uses a lot of one fits one size fits all um, interventions. And unfortunately, that doesn't always reach uh, the most underreached people. And so we have to start tailoring these types of interventions to be able to reach everyone. And so first, uh, what is zero dose? Zero dose means a child who has, had, who has not had any immunizations. Um, under vaccinated means the child has had some vaccinations, but not all. So that's a very quick uh, definition there. And so what is zero dose mapping? So zero dose mapping is the act of uh, mapping to understand the number of zero dose children, where they live, and why they haven't been reached. And so why we want to conduct this is because um, we need to do this to better target interventions, uh, improve supply chain, and vaccine forecasting. And so our end goal for zero dose mapping is uh, to provide a better process for identifying zero dose children and identifying those barriers that caregivers face to access healthcare. And so for the methods for this project, uh, so beginning, we did a literature review to understand what had other people done so we could see um, what worked, what didn't. And so we kind of found that everything fell into two buckets. It was either a high level multi-country overview or it was um, like, which, sorry for the high level, high level multi-country analysis. This work can be done quickly, doesn't require large amounts of time and money. But the problem is it only gives me the, the estimate total number of zero dose children for the entire country of Mozambique. That's not very useful. Um, the other type of data work that we saw was, was geospatial analysis with original data collection. Um, so this is great. It allows for in-depth uh, analysis at a micro level and also allows for validation of the data. Problem is, is it's very timely and it's costly. We didn't have any of those uh, resources. So we had to figure out something else. And so this was the methods that we used for this project. Um, our first was to validate that target population. So understand the true number of children there actually are in the areas. The second was to validate the number of children who had been actually vaccinated. Um, the third was to then calculate the number of zero, the percentage of zero dose children. And then finally to do the fun part, the geospatial mapping. So we did this work in four countries, in CDI, DRC, Malawi, and Mozambique. Um, so for CDI, we were able to do it in all provinces except for the two major cities and at the third administrative level. In DRC, we were able to do it in four provinces, um, again, at the third administrative level, which is called the health zone. In Malawi, we were able to do it in one district, um, and our analysis was at the fourth administrative level, which is uh, health catchment. And then Mozambique, it was in two provinces, um, again, at that third administrative level, which is a district. Oh, Cote d'Ivoire, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, Cote d'Ivoire and Democratic Republic of Congo. Those are good questions. Um, so that first step that we had was to validate that target population. So when we originally ran this, we used our traditional sources like the DHIS2, which is the, it collects the number of children who have been born at health facilities, and then also like the census data. And we were seeing numbers of like 153% of children have been vaccinated. It's like, that denominator's off. <laughs> So we use a, a little bit more of a non-traditional source. So we use vaccination campaigns. And the reason we did this is because vaccination campaigns go out into the community and they try and find every single person rather than waiting for people to come to the health facility. So when we did that, we actually found um, in the areas that we worked, 350,000 more children. And it was across all four countries. So you can see that that was a better target number for us. The next step was to validate the actual number of children who have been vaccinated. So currently the standard to to identify zero dose children is to target or <laughs> to calculate the number off a of DPT, which is um, diphtheria, pertosis, and tetanus. Um, and so 
if a child's been vaccinated for that, then they're not considered zero dose. If they haven't been vaccinated for that, then they're considered zero dose. The problem, though, is um, stockouts are a common, uh, f uh, common occurrence. And so a lot of children are being um, calculated as zero dose when they're actually not. So what we did was, <laughs> sorry, losing my breath. <laughs> um, so what we ended up doing was uh, taking the max number of children who had been vaccinated across four vaccines that were given simultaneously. So it was uh, DBT, PCV, which is um, pneumococcal, OPV, which is polio, and RV, which is rotavirus. And so from there, we were able to better target the actual number of children who'd been vaccinated. And so by doing this, we um, actually found that about 14,000 children um, actually had been vaccinated who had been counted as zero dose. So now we've uh, now we've better targeted those uh, numerator and denominator. And so from there to calculate the percentage of children vaccinated, we just divide those two together, which brings, oh, I talked about this, uh, which brings us to how we calculated the percentage of zero dose children. This was actually quite simple since we had the percentage of children who were vaccinated. All we did was subtract it from 100 and we got the percentage of zero dose children. And so what this did was it gave us and we did, the, my colleague Timoteo, he's not here, but um, he did this in Excel. And so it gave us a lot of numbers, but that isn't very useful. Like it, it's kind of helpful, but we can do better than that. So that's where the geospatial came back in. And so we really needed to find that middle ground approach because we couldn't do the multi-country. We couldn't do that um, original data collection. And so we needed that light touch approach. And so our requirements for this um, process were that it, the analysis needed to be done um, at that third or fourth administrative level. We had to use open source software and we had to use open source data um, because we were trying to do this in light approach that could be easily replicated across four ge geographies, which was a little bit of a challenge. And so we use QGIS, which um, I've been using QGIS since about 2016 in an like very small ways and like how projects need it. So I'm very grateful for this open source software because I've been able to do some things that projects that can't pay for ArcGIS would, wouldn't been able to do anything. And so bringing us back to this table here, those numbers that don't really mean a whole lot. When I threw them on a map, now we can see um, we've got some, some areas where we can see hotspots of, zero, of high rates of zero dose children, especially in the Northeast quadrant along the lake. Um, Lake Malawi here. So this is Mangochi District. Um, we can also see some other high areas um, and then some areas that we're doing pretty well in. And so this is what it looked like at the fourth administrative level. So at the fourth administrative level for the health catchments, they don't have um, set districts or set geography or boundaries. <laughs> they can overlap with one another. People can go to one or the other. So we had to use the, uh, the actual coordinates for the health facilities that were, um, that were tagged with each of those health catchments. And so that's what it looked like at the fourth administrative level. And for the other three countries, when we did it at the third administrative level, we were able to actually use boundaries. And so we could see a little bit here. So this is Equator province in DRC. And we can see, you know, we've got some congregating of some high rates of zero dose children in the, um, the south part of the province along the border, um, in the center, and then along that northeast uh, quadrant up there. And so now we wanted to understand what are the barriers. So now we've put all the zero dose children on the map. Now, what are some of these potential barriers? So through that literature review that we did, we identified, I think around about 15 um, different data sources that other people had used. So we we're like, okay, what data actually goes down to these levels? Cause that's always a problem. It usually stops around like the province level. And so we we're like, well, what can we actually do? And so like one, one of the um, factors we know that contributes to high rates of zero dose children is um, maternal education. And unfortunately that data set it went to the province that for a second administrative level. So there was nothing we could do to get that one in here. But what we were able to do is pull in the location of populated places so we can see how many health facilities uh, or how many communities each health facility is supporting. We could pull in the location of the health facilities um, so we can see how far people have to travel. Uh, we could pull in the location of violent conflicts to see if it's dangerous for people to get the vaccinations. We could pull in floods. This one was a little bit different. Um, we either could pull in the number of floods that occurred during a certain time period or the flood risk. And then the other one we could pull in was food insecurity. So um, what their food insecurity ratings were. So this is where it kind of got a lot of fun. <laughs> 
Um, so the first analysis that we did was the number of communities supported by health facilities. And so the analysis that we did was we used the nearest neighbor analysis between each populated place and health facility and made it identify which one was closest. So it looked kind of like this on a map. This is in CDI. And then basically it would calculate for us how many of those health facilities. So then we could um, aggregate up to the district level and get the averages. We were able then to use um, R to do statistical analysis to see if these were actual statistically significant correlations. So for CDI, DRC, and Mozambique, it wasn't statistically significant. Um, but for Malawi, we did find that it did contribute to higher rates of zero-dose children. Our next analysis was the distance between each populated place and health facility. So um, after we use, we just used the nearest neighbor that we just did on the previous slide, and then we made the districts matrix calculate that distance for us, and then calculate the average um, for each district. So again, using that same map, it then told us how far each one was away. And this is by, um, not sure how to word this, like as the crow flies. So it's, it, we weren't using roads, uh, we tried to use roads. In some of the areas that we were working, it's pretty remote. And so it's really challenging to calculate that distance on the road. And also in like the DRC where the rainy season can make a one hour journey, a five hour journey, it's really challenging to calculate that. So we ended up just going with the actual distance between two points. And so we found in CDI, we didn't have any statistically significant findings, um, but in DRC, Malawi, uh, we both, both those countries we did. And in Mozambique, we actually found something interesting. In one province, uh, we found that the, the zero dose had higher rates of zero dose children closer to health facilities. And then the other province, we found the opposite. So they were further away. That's not as uncommon as you would think because there are high pockets of zero dose children in very large, um, in very large cities. So, but that was really interesting for us to be able to to do that, to point to it and be like, oh, okay, so you need to do more, um, you would need to target interventions in the actual cities versus trying to do the mobile brigades that go out 15 kilometers away from the health facility. So our next analysis was the distance between health facility and conflicts. So we wanted to know um, how many conflicts happened within a five kilometer radius of that health facility. So again, using that nearest neighbor, which is a very weird term to use with <laughs> conflicts, um, we first calculated um, how far away each conflict was from the health facilities, and then the distance um, between those conflicts. So this is what it kind of looked like. Um, so we we're only interested, in, this is an example from Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, and so we were only interested in the ones that were within five kilometers. Um, and so for the three countries, Cote d'Ivoire, DRC, and Malawi, we didn't have statistically significant findings. We didn't think we would, um, just because there isn't a lot of conflict in the areas that we were looking in. Um, but in Mozambique, we did, which uh, you'll see why, because Cabo Delgado has had quite a bit of conflict in the in two-year time period. So if I were a caregiver and it was between my child's measles vaccine and potentially being harmed on the way to the health facility, you know, as a caregiver, you may take the choice to not give them the measles vaccine, uh, which is com completely irrational. And so the next one that we did was food insecurity. This was a score that was given by the ICSP. And so we wanted to do a statistical analysis here to see if we could, if there was a correlation between the food insecurity score and the percentage of zero dose children. So what we did was we first overlaid it um, onto a map to see what it actually looked like. The colors are a little bit off and hard to see here, but we only found in CDI, in Cote d'Ivoire here, we only found that in one, um, in one district here, we had a little bit of crossover. Uh, this is a high rate of zero dose children and these bluer areas are high rates of food insecurity. And so it wasn't statistically significant finding, but it was kind of interesting to overlay for us to see how those two uh, variables interact. And so again, we ran the statistical analysis in R and so, we didn't have um, statistically significant findings for CD CDI and DRC. Malawi, unfortunately, that data didn't go down to the health catchment level, so we couldn't use it. And then Mozambique, we did find um, it was a, there was a correlation there. And so finally, <laughs> the last one that we looked at was flooding. So like I said, this one was a little bit different where we either had to look at the number of floods or what their flood risk was. And so, <laughs> sorry. Um, again, we did that statistical analysis and we did the overlay. 
And so here again with CDI or Cote d'Ivoire, we can see that, <clears throat> uh, that we didn't really have any overlap with floods. And it turned out in um, all the countries, we didn't have any statistical findings. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. Um, in DRC, we did, my colleague was able to do um, interviews and he did find out um, from a couple of the districts that there were floods that happened in those areas and they did halt immunization services, but it just wasn't a strong enough finding for us to be able to say it was, it was a correlation. In Malawi, we didn't have um, actual numeric data. And so uh, we used a map um, from um, Doctors Without Borders to show where the floods had actually happened and just marked a yes or no. So we didn't feel comfortable um, saying that that was statistically significant, but we did. But from a visualization, we did see a correlation. <clears throat> And so what this was able to do for us is that we were able to create basically um, profiles for each of the provinces to un better understand of if we wanted to target, um, if we wanted to target interventions in Lug Luganga Health Center, um, what were the, the contributing factors that uh, were leading to, uh, to zero dose children there? And so this is what um, we were able to produce to the ministries of health. Any questions? Also, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, there seems to be a lot of repeating steps in your analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, did you make use of uh, like the model designer in QGIS to, um, well, to build up those steps and then easily reproduce uh, the analysis? No, so I didn't know about that um, until I attended a talk earlier. And so I was like, okay, I will definitely improve on some steps here. This was me Googling and watching YouTube videos and going, okay, how do we do this? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I also learned not to cut my data set, uh, truncate like data that I don't need off of the data set. So that's, I also learned that this morning as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. How will your data be used like forward? Did, will you present it to the government or mm -hmm. yes so um, my colleague Timotio he presented to the government and um, he's based in Mozambique so it's a little bit cheaper for him to <laughs> to travel to countries than me um, and so he was able to present to the country uh, to the ministries of health and so our project has we're almost to an end and so we just finished up our data collection this process about a month or two ago and so now we're starting to incorporate it into other work that we're doing so we're using some of the same analysis that we did here to identify <clears throat> children who have dropped um who uh, have missed their uh, measles vaccination which is given at nine months um, which this is about a three month or it's about six months past this last vaccine so we're starting to use these analysis for different projects Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Stephanie, for the talk. A big round of applause.